working. I mean, the problem is, un until the four tops together with the governor sit down and meaningfully and seriously begin to negotiate, it's not going to happen. Well, why aren't they? That's the point. Why aren't they doing it? Because you and, well, first of all, because the government's continuing to work, and most of the state employees are, st are continuing to work, and services in many cases are being delivered. So most people don't care. And if most people don't care, there's no force to change it. If state workers, because there was no budget, weren't ordered back to work by the courts, and they were, in fact, on the street, and services weren't being performed, then I think you would see an entirely different situation. You may get that. We're not going to go into it, but there's some technical issues that have arisen in the well, last you're, 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 court rulings. You're, 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 you're a lawyer. I don't understand how the courts can challenge. I hope you like that clip. Look, that was a really good clip because it featured Ron Gidwitz. I'm Jeff Berkowitz, host and producer of Public Affairs. Don't turn that dial because if you do, if you do, you're going to miss a really, really, really good show. So, Ron. The thing of it is here, let's go over to the state issues first, okay? Sure. What, it can't be that hard. How do we fix things? What is wrong? Uh, well, let me stick to one question. What's wrong? Is it the state of Illinois that's the problem? Is it Chicago that's the problem? Is it the governor, the speaker? What's wrong with politics and policy in Chicago and the state of Illinois? Jeff, I got to tell you, I'm not totally certain, but somehow the folks in Springfield, at least it seems to me, have forgotten why they went there. And they went there to, to work for the people of the state of Illinois. And the whole group of them seems to have forgotten that because we haven't, contrary to what you said, we haven't had a budget for 10 months. They should have passed a budget by the end of May last year. That's true. We're in April, so we're yes, in, 10 months. So something, something more than 10 months, and we haven't had a budget. We're operating under the aegis of the courts with no budget. There shouldn't have been any expenditures by well, the... Well, it's not that bad because, because of court order and continuing resolutions and all that stuff, I'm told we're spending about at the same rate, at about 90% or, or more of what we were spending in fiscal... 2015, right? We don't have a fiscal 2016 budget, that's right? Yeah. So we're spending 90% or so of what 2015. One problem with that is that fiscal 2015 budget had what, about three or four billion dollars more in revenue than yeah. we have in this budget. So our revenue's gone down by about three or four billion dollars. Our spending has gone down barely by five or 10%. So we're running things at about a four billion dollar annualized deficit We've been doing so for 10 months, so we almost have a, we probably have the equivalent of a $3 billion deficit for the first 10 months, right? Well, hey, folks, if you notice that math, I'm not a comptroller, I'm nothing, but yet, isn't that amazing that I come up with all of that? Assuming that it's right, and I'm not so sure that it is, because we finished last year with a, with a deficit. Well, okay, I'm with just a, saying... With a cash deficit. Well, that, there's a difference, stocks and flows, Ron, because we had a stock problem, that is, we had unpaid bills last year. Right. So as we started June of 20, 2015, which would have been the start of fiscal 2016, we, are, we were 3 or $4 billion in the hole, that's what you're telling me, right? I think we were more, but that's at we, least. Can, we can start with that. Okay, so at least four billion in the hole. But now you're saying we. I'm saying we have an additional deficit that accumulates, makes our hole even larger, or our stack of unpaid bills even larger. So if we started with four billion and we've added three or four billion, we're probably about eight billion in the hole now, right? I, I, the state of Illinois, at least. And I, you know, remember it's April. But Ron, I, I, th I, th I think that the comptroller said that we were going to be at ten billion. Uh, by the end of the year. So. Yeah, yeah, so the point is, that's a bit of a problem, and folks, we'll, we'll handle that quickly at the end of the show. Let's go over another one. I was thinking, like, what is wrong with Chicago? What is wrong with Chicago? These people here, if you're watching this on the west side, you're watching on the south side, you know, there's a lot of killings going on, a lot of murders, shootings, people are stepping out, innocent good people get caught in between gunfire. If you're in Winneka, it's probably okay, but once you, want, you wander over to some other area, or there's a random shooting, so people are dying. The short of it, folks, and kids are dying. Kids are going to slumber parties on the west side and the south side, and they're not making their way home. They stand up, and bullets come through the windows. Am I exaggerating? No, but I think it's worse than that, because you could be standing on a street corner. Right there, and you're shot. And you're shot. And you're dead. 
Yeah, any any, any, any time, day or night, people are getting shot, and it's just it, it's just a tragic situation. So why don't we do something about it? We've had a new mayor. I mean, he's not new now. He was reelected about a year ago, and he was new four years ago. He's been there five years. His name is Rahm Emanuel. He's had five years. Has life gotten worse? Because aren't killings spiking? Has life gotten worse in the last few years or better? Well, certainly this year's the, the rate is twice as running twice as much as last year, at least in so far as the first. So two. let's start there. Okay. Let's fix. Let's do something to stop those killings. And what do we do? Well, I, I wish I had all the answers, as I'm sure you, you wish you had. You are chairman emeritus of the Boys and Girls Club of America, right? Yes. You, your entity helps about four million kids stay on the straight and narrow, right? Yep. A year. Nationally. And that's a great deal because you tell me, how much does it cost per kid to do it? It's $500 a kid is what it costs. To keep that kid out of trouble, to keep them on the straight and the narrow, and to, and to do what? To help them get educated, to, to teach them certain life skills. We teach them leadership. That is the best deal in town. Oh, it's a terrific deal. And most of it comes from where? Seventy uh, percent of what we do is paid for philanthropically, and the other thirty percent primarily is paid for, for by various public sector entities. This is a good story, as they say. This yeah. is good news. Well, we've got, as you said, four million kids in our programs. We've got uh, we have the largest youth-serving organization for Native American youngsters, Eskimos, Hawaiians, and Native American Indians. Uh, we've got almost half a million youngsters in our military uh, children of military personnel. Uh, we're on every military, military base here and okay. abroad where there are kids. So you're doing a lot, but we need to do more in Chicago. Tell the mayor, tell the governor, well, whoever you want to tell them. Tell them what to do, Ron. Here's the, here's the problem. Ron, you ran for governor. If you had been elected in 2006, we would have fixed all these problems. I'm by sure. Right. I'm so, sure. But since you weren't, you've got to tell them. Tell Rauner what to do. Tell Emanuel what to do. Here's the problem. In, in Illinois, we've got 62,000 kids in our programs. In, in Chicago, we've got 30,000, but in, also in Chicago, there's 100,000 gang members. Think about that. Three times as many gang members as there are Boys and Girls Clubs. Kids. So what do we do with those kids? Do we write them off? Do we go shoot them? What do we do? Well, we can't. Unfortunately, we put too many of them in jail. What we really ought to be doing is making sure they get a good education, and then they get a good job. And unfortunately, we've created a situation here in, in Illinois and in Chicago where the kinds of jobs that these youngsters are frequently qualified for don't exist, particularly in the inner city. The jobs don't exist? The jobs don't exist. What kind of jobs would they be? I remember when I was growing up, and frankly when I was a younger adult, we had factories in the city that would employ people that have somewhat more limited skills than the, the, the folks that are now majorly being employed. Our economy in this city has changed from a manufacturing economy, which it was of significant note, to a knowledge economy. And so if you don't have not just a high school education, but some college, it's very difficult today to get a job in this town. Okay, so eventually we'd like to make many, not all, but many of these kids college educated so they could get those jobs. Or tech trained. Or tech trained, but in the meantime, can we really do anything? Because people would say, Ron, that was, we're losing those manufacturing jobs overseas. Those were the, that's where the salaries are lower. They'll never come back. Are those people right? Uh, I, no, I don't think so. Quite frankly, I don't know that the jobs, the significant number of jobs are moving overseas so much as they are being automated. Because we have made the cost of hiring people so expensive relative to other places that companies, as a defensive measure, are automating as fast as they possibly how, can. How have we made the cost of hiring so high? Regulation, the tax, the, the tax burden on companies' state and federal taxes, regulation. Uh, I mean, just in this state, workman's compensation, unemployment compensation, and a whole list of things that are required of corporations by the city of Chicago, the county of Cook, and the state of Illinois make it much more difficult to conduct manufacturing operations here than, say, even as close as Indiana, where and companies are so moving. So you say that. Are there experts who, I mean, have you studied this? Are there people who have studied this kind of thing? Well, there's, there are consultants in many places that do this kind of work. There's, what, a group here, there's, a, there's a group here. There's a group. Well, they're called relocation experts, but there's a group here in Chicago, which is one of the preeminent groups, a company called Fantas, who uh, will, companies will hire and say, where, where should I move what we do and, and do it most economically? So, so 
the mayor and the governor, as a joint effort, maybe with the Senate leaders as well, should call a meeting and sit down and have these guys come in to Speaker Mike Madigan, Senate President John Cullerton, Senate Republican Leader Chris Redonio, House Republican Leader, House Republican Leader, Jim Durkin. Jim Durkin. I was going to say Tom Cross, sorry. Of course, Jim Durkin has replaced Tom Cross as House Republican Leader. So they should sit down, the four leaders, the governor, the city, perhaps some other people, and get some of this information. And then they should embark on a program jointly, Democrats and Republicans, of, you know, of figuring out a program to get this done, right? Well, that's what I would do quite candidly. And I remember back when Jim Thompson was the governor and Mike Madigan was the Speaker of the House. Lee Daniels was the minority leader in the House. Phil Rock was the president of the Senate. And Pate Phillip was the, was the minority leader. And uh, there was a program called Quarters of Opportunity. And it was a, a program designed by the executive branch to encourage job creation all over the state. And all four leaders got behind it. OK, so it's, it's kind of a mystery why that's not happening. Because you said, to start this show, Democrats and Republicans were elected to solve these kinds of problems, to work together, to turn around this economy, right? To turn around this economy, exactly. We do need, and we have a governor who's, who ran on that called the turnaround agenda. And unfortunately, right now, I don't see any compromises being well, made. Why do you suppose that is? I, I, I can't tell you directly. I mean, we've got the governor on one hand who says, this is my agenda and it's important to me, and, and the Speaker of the House says, Here's, here's what I need, and they somehow can't seem to get together with uh, President Cullerton, maybe someplace in the middle. Well, it's a, it's, a, it's a great idea, and I think, I'm sure that the governor and the four tops might be sitting around watching this program, and they're going to thank you, Ron, for doing it. Well, maybe maybe you could be an ex officio member of this group when they invite in, what's the name of that company? Fantas. Fantas. Or, I mean, there's others. But others can well. come in, too. You can bring yeah. in two or three, get those ideas. Some of them they might like, some of them they, they won't, but at least it gives them some impartial ideas of an outsider, a third party, to what they can do to get this state moving, right? Well, these, these people every day are doing this for corporations, telling them where they can go to get the best economic value. And it makes sense, even before they tell us, probably you'd like to see taxes come down corporate taxes on the state level, state income taxes, uh, sales I, I, taxes, I, property taxes. I, I'm not sure that's what really what's required. What's re why, 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 why? You can pick any one of them and say, we should, we should reduce it, and of course, having less cost. But the overall, the cost overall of doing it. The, the overall, look at the overall cost of business. In some cases, you may be high relative to other people. In other cases, you may be low. I don't know, for example, that the state income tax, corporate income tax, is that in and of itself is that out of line. It's when you add up all of the expenses that are created here by various things, whether it's taxes or regulation, uh, and you compare that to other places, the, the market basket of costs for doing business in Illinois is more expensive than a variety of other places. And you add to that the uncertainty of the support that the government's gonna or not give, going to or not going to give you, uh, and uh, the fact that there is no budget, the fact that there is a certain, particularly in Chicago, level of violence, which may be for most of us someplace else, doesn't make any difference if you're reading the newspaper and trying to figure out where you want to go. You don't want to go to a place where they're shooting people every day. Some say to the governor, he's got this thing called the turnaround agenda, right? You know that. You're familiar I, with it. I'm, well, I'm somewhat familiar with it. You know, some say he needs to just focus on the budget. We don't have a budget. He needs to figure out what he would agree to in terms of new revenue on the revenue side, what kind of cuts in spending he wants what the Democrats and Republicans would agree to on spending cuts, and get a budget, and then they'll come back and talk about reform. What do you say? Do you think they have a point, or do you think you need to talk about reform at the same time that you're talking about the budget? I, I think we need to have a strategic vision for this state that talks about how we're going to get to a place where people get a decent education, all of us, where there are a sufficient number of jobs tailored to the population that is currently existent. And I don't think that just passing a budget solves that problem. 
It's going to take a number of years to get out of the fiscal problem that we're in. And in, in doing so, we have to have a broader view of how we're going to change the economics of the state to much, make it much more friendly for and helpful to the people that live here. Throughout the state of Illinois? Everywhere, yes. Yeah. And so you've mentioned education is key. Um, I've talked about CPS, Chicago Public Schools, that it's 85% minority, 25% of the black kids in fourth grade read at grade level, a bit more who are Hispanic. That's 85% of the kids reading at 25. 85% of the kids for whom only 25 or 30% read at grade level, 70% or more are not. How do we change that? How do we get those numbers up to 60, 70, 80%? Well, the first thing we need to do is we need to measure the performance of each of these youngsters every regularly, whether it's once a week, once a month. I remember when I was growing up and going to school, there were tests virtually every Friday measuring what I knew. What you knew. Not what just, I knew. Not necessarily standardized tests, but no, something that tells the teacher whether what you know and whether it's getting better. And if I... If I measured up every week of the year, by the time you got to the end of the year, I, I was able to pass the standardized tests because I knew the stuff that was supposed to. See, and if I didn't know, I would get pulled out of recess or gym or some other activity, and I would be assisted until I learned what I needed to know. Because that was key. You need to know the certain things. And, and you can't get behind because when you get behind, and you talk about fourth grade, if you're behind in third grade to any great degree, or if you will, fourth grade, you're probably going to stay behind. And so it is terribly important that, that the teacher understands and knows just exactly where each youngster is in his or her class all along the way so that at the end of the year when they take those standardized tests, it shouldn't be a shock that they don't pass. You know, why do you suppose we're, it sounds like you think we're not doing these things, where I've quoted statistics as to how poorly we're doing. <clears throat> why aren't we getting better? Why are, if, if some of these things are going wrong, what corrective mechanisms exist in society to start getting it right? Well, first of all, we aren't, as a, pop, as, as a public, angry enough about the poor performance of our public schools, because if we were, that would be the number one thing on our agenda to have a public school system that, in fact, educates our young. So say we did that. Say that was number one. Say the mayor heard that. The mayor's got a lot of input. He appoints, well, he, he appoints the board members. The board members at CPS in turn choose a superintendent who's currently Forrest Claypool. So the mayor has a lot to say how the board and the superintendent they appoint run things. Um, is there another force here that's at work? Say the board and the superintendent want to do what you want, and, and say they start doing it. Do you think they can do it, or do they run into some well, the, other the, force that might prevent them? Well, well Jeff, I know what you're, what, you're, what you're getting to, trying to get me to say that we have a, teach, well, I would not we have a teacher's union problem, but I don't know that that's necessarily the, the next order of problem. Really? Really. I think we have a leadership problem in our schools. We have some principals in our schools who are terrific. And we have some other principals in our schools who are not terrific. And we have a bunch of principals in the middle. And if we hamstring our principals from doing their jobs for whatever reason, and there's plenty of bureaucracy coming down from the central office to take people's time away from what they ought to be doing, which is improving the quality of well, teaching in the classroom. This that isn't, to, that isn't to say that we, don't, that, that we shouldn't be improving the quality of teaching by making changes of our classroom teachers, because where we need to do that, we should do that. But I think we've got a leadership problem in our school buildings. And so does that mean the principal is the problem, or somebody over the principal is the I, problem? I think it's a combination of, uh, I think it's a combination of uh, our principals, in too many cases, aren't strong enough that we have a lot of bureaucracy at the central office, that we ask principals to do stuff that's not ter terribly productive with respect to making sure that the kids are getting the kind of education. And then we've got teachers that aren't strong enough. It's, but it's a complex. It's not just one issue. We can't just blame the teachers or blame the union, because I don't think that's the single problem. OK. So does the leadership come from the superintendent? Does it come from the board? Who controls this bureaucracy, if you're saying that's the problem? It's not self-controlled. 
somebody's got to have, I presume, the authority to get obstacles out of the way if they're being put in the way of principals and so forth, teachers. Right? Well, I, I, I think the buck stops with the CEO and the board. <clears throat> that would be the superintendent and the board. They should be responsible. That's, I, I, in most organizations, that's who you look at. And if they're not the right people, the mayor appoints them, so he should be appointing other people. But the mayor just appointed Forrest Claypool, what, two years ago? Well, the mayor appointed the board, and the board chose the CEO. Uh, correct. So technically, That's correct. unless you're saying the mayor whispers in the board's ear, and then they do what the mayor wants, possibly. I, 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 I don't know. I, I, I certainly don't know. Well, you were, I would not speculate. Well, you were head, what was it, head of the city college system, right? I, I was both head of the city college system as well as for uh, four years chairman of the State Board of Education. And, and who appointed you to those positions? Uh, I was appointed by the governor to the, to, as chairman of the State Board of Education. I was appointed uh, by the mayor and confirmed by the city council as. Well, the, when you were appointed there, did the mayor do some whispering in your ears? Did the, did the governor do some whispering in your ears so that you would do what they wanted as board chairman? That, whether it was at the State Board of Education or the city, what was it, city colleges? I, I can quite honestly say that if they had, I would have been, I would have quit. So it was up to you to do it? I, I took the job. Were, if they thought you were doing a good job, they left you alone? I took the job on the condition that I would receive no interference from either okay. the governor or the mayor, well, the respective jobs. And they, quite frankly, were, we didn't always agree. And there may have been issues, particularly when I was chairman of the State Board of Education, that the governor and I disagreed on. But he never told me how to run, how to do the job. Okay, so we got to pick it up a little bit, but let me just go quickly to my, my, yeah, okay, yeah, this is what you would guess. I would think, look, you're a business guy. You were at Aline Curtis. It's a family business. You rose through the ranks. You ran it. They did extremely well, so well Unilever wanted it. You made a bundle when you sold to Unilever. You know business. You know the importance of sales. You were in sales. You were overseeing it. Look, I'm not just buttering you up. You knew competition because you knew if you didn't do a good job, that company wouldn't have been worth anything and you'd be in trouble and the family would be in Worse, trouble. Worse, I'd be out. You could, you'd be out. I'd be out. They'd find somebody else, right? Yeah. Competition, the patron saint of the consumer. So why we really have to have competition here, whether it comes from Claypool, whether it comes from the board, I don't care who it comes from. We have charter schools right now. Yes. We have four, about 400,000 students total in CPS. About 15 percent, 60,000 go to charter schools. Correct. They provide an outlet. If it's the traditional neighborhood school is not going, the parents can apply to go to a charter school for various reasons by the government, not by the private market. Charter schools, there are fewer of them than kids who want to go to them. So we hold lotteries when there's excess demand. So somebody at CPS should say, let's get more charter schools so demand would be open to the supply. But until we do, that's a good thing. They have these outlets, okay? And you might, some people say charter schools don't perform. Let's publish all that information. Let the parents decide. But let's publish the information about how the traditional neighborhood schools are performing and about the charter schools, and then let the consumers decide. Is that a bad idea? No, I think it's a fine idea. We're starting to get standards. It turns out this is nothing, we don't have this. They have some information on charter schools, apparently less on the traditional neighborhood schools. They close some of these charter schools. They have to go through a process. Let's get that going faster. Well, let's also not forget that we also have private schools, in, particularly in Chicago, the Archdiocesan public uh, private schools, the Catholic schools, the Lutheran schools. Let them take the money and go to those schools. We, those, the barriers have been cleared away a decade ago when Barack Obama said here, sat here in 2002, there was a Supreme Court opinion that said you can do that. There's no separate problem with church and state. Just make sure the parents have the control. You're not supporting the school. You're supporting the parents. It hasn't happened. Let's get that going. You're right. There are all these schools. They could be Catholic schools, they could be Jewish schools, I don't care, they could be agnostic schools. They are alternatives. They are competition, right? Yes. Am I the only one who's indignant about this? I mean, you're telling me about these kids who are dying, they're getting shot, they're not learning how to read. We gotta like step on the accelerator to get them to learn how to read fast so they don't drop out, so they don't try, join gangs, so they don't kill people. That's why I say to you and said just a moment ago, we're not angry enough. The public isn't angry enough Get about, angry the out there, folks. about the Get condition angry. of our schools. Get because angry and tell your governor and tell your mayor and tell your city councilman, you want competition. When they say the union's the solution, say that's fine, let the union compete, 
but in the meantime, they're going to have to compete with charter schools and other schools and so forth. And I don't right? care whether it's a public school, a private school, a charter school. I want good schools. Okay. And if the, public could, if the public schools could provide them, God bless. So we've solved that problem, folks. Those kids are doing the killing. They're going to go back to school. They're going to learn how to read. I'm not kidding. But then we've got to create an environment so they can get a job. Right. So then we're going to lower the tax burden, lower the regulatory burden. Cullerton's going to come here on the show and tell us what he's going to do as Senate president to tell public affairs and tell all of you how he agrees he's going to lead the way with Democrats and Republicans to lower these burdens. And Rauner's going to do that. I mean, here's the real mystery. This is for you. A mystery for Mr. Governor Rauner. Yeah, he's got $700 million in net worth, right? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I was, uh, people say that. Bruce, is that what it is? Come here and tell me. I won't tell anybody. Just whisper in my ear. Okay, but sir, he's got a lot of money. That's, there's nothing wrong. I, I, it's great to have a lot of money. My point is it frees him up. You know, it's kind of like Trump, which I hope we get to. Maybe we can do that quickly. It's kind of like Trump. You know, if you got a lot of money, you don't have to rely on others. You're not beholden to anybody. He's not. Let's just do it, Bruce. I mean, come on this show and then explain to people what you want to do. Get the word out. You've got this agenda. You've been there for a year. What have you done? You should be out there out there every day talking about the agenda. You should have surrogates. You should be hiring Ron Gidwitz to do it. All your corporate friends. I thought this was my interview. Well, I'm just trying to get you involved in here. You well, gotta, le we gotta leverage you, okay? I mean, don't you agree with me? He shouldn't he be doing that stuff? I, th I think Bruce is out doing some, a lot of that stuff right now. But why isn't it working? Why, why is there an impasse for nine months? If he's doing it, why isn't it working? I mean, the problem is, until the four tops together with the governor sit down and meaningfully and seriously begin to negotiate, it's not going to happen. Well, why aren't they? That's the point. Why aren't they doing because it? Because you and, well, first of all, because the government's continuing to work and most of the state employees are, st are continuing to work and services in many cases are being delivered. So most people don't care. And if most people don't care, there's no force to change it. If state workers, because there was no budget, weren't ordered back to work by the courts and they were in fact on the street and services weren't being performed, then I think you would see an entirely different situation. You may get that. As I understand it, that the state employees have a contract with the state and therefore you, because there's no budget doesn't mean you shouldn't pay them. Yeah, although that's, that's what's under review because you, the people thought you had to have appropriations, they couldn't be paid. There's some technical things coming up. You may get your wish. And that's not have, my wish. I'm may, just saying that if, they, if, if, if they, we're going to move it along, if we're going to move it. You need those pressure points. You need right those now, pressure no, points. No, nobody but the poorest among us are suffering. People that need the services of our city. Everybody needs so, to suffer. Everybody would complain, and then it would get done. That's your point? That, when everybody's suffering, or when a lot of people are suffering, not just the poorest of the poor, and the young people that are trying to go to college who have the least ability to pay. Let's do it. I hope you're going to come back. Ron Gidwitz, thank you so much. How do people get in touch with the Boys and Girls Club? Uh, BGCA.org. Uh, what is it? $500 a kid, and you save that kid's life yeah. and make the country a yeah, lot better. Yeah, just Google B Boys and Girls Clubs of America, and you can on the web our website, you can find your local club. Get involved. We very much appreciate anything that you can do to help these youngsters. Four million kids across the country, 62,000 kids in Illinois. We've got uh, over 1,000 full, full and part-time employees and almost 4,000 volunteers working with these kids here just in Illinois. And you're a part of the group. You're a chairman emeritus of the board. You're like the franchisor. These groups are like franchisees. You give them the support. You and others give them the services. So these these local clubs can go out there and save these kids' lives and make this a better country. That's what we do, and if you, we do surveys of our alumni uh, regularly, and 57% of them regularly say we saved their life. Not just that we made their life better, we saved their life when you talk to an ex, a Boys and Girls Club graduate, an alumnus. All right, folks, you heard it here. You get in touch because you do the right thing. And you remember, Ron Gibbons is going to come back. Are you going to do it for sure? Sure. Thank you so much, Ron, for coming. And you come back next week and every week to Public Affairs.